Well, it's a great pleasure and privilege to have former warden Ron Thompson to talk to you today. Uh, Ron, Ron and I were just, the last time we met was in the early 80s during a tumultuous time in the country's history with um, the unrest in Madabee land. And uh, we went through a very dangerous period in our lives. And um, in a way, I suppose we, we're lucky to be alive today. But uh, Ron, uh, welcome and thanks very much for your time. My pleasure. Ron, just um, go back to the beginning, uh, where, were you, where you were born and a little bit about your life leading up to going into national parks. Okay, um, I was actually born in England two weeks before the start of World War II. And my father trained as a pilot in the Royal Air Force. And at that time, um, every time they had young pilots fly up from the training squadrons, the Messerschmitts of the Germans would come over and, and shoot them out of the sky. So they were having trouble replacing pilots who were actually killed in, in, in action. So they sent their young pilots out to Canada, to Australia, and to South Africa or Southern Africa to get trained because there were no Messerschmitts coming out of the, the, the skies then to shoot them out. And that's where all the RAF pilots were trained. Now, my father first came to Cape Town in South Africa, then to um, to Ferenichen. From there, he went up to Moffat in the middle of the country near Guelo in, in Rhodesia, and then up to um, Mount Hamden, north of, of what was Salisbury City then, now Harare, and that's where he trained. Now, in Rhodesia, he, he met a lot of, of farmers who were taking the, the young Air Force guys out onto the farms for weekends. Um, when they had a bit of time off and they played tennis and they had a good time and they probably ate a lot of brine, brine meat and things like that. And they, they got to know each other. And then when the war ended, um, my father said, this is not a country. Britain was then smashed to pieces. And um, he said, this isn't a country to start a new life with a new young family. So he brought us out to South Africa, first of all. Now his trade was an electrician with Stuarts and Lloyds. Uh, in a little town called Corby in Northamptonshire. And so he came out here and he sought uh, a job in the same profession. He couldn't get into Stuarts and Lloyds because they didn't have any vacancies in Ferenichen. So he then joined uh, the United Steel Company, USCO, which also had a, um, a um, business in Ferenichen. And then from there, he brought the family out. <coughs> That's where, where I actually started my my career in South Africa. Um, I went to school there as a, as, a, as a little boy running around like all the little Africana boys without any shoes on or anything. Um, and uh, uh, then they the, uh, they went up to Rhodesia to cut a long story short and they hooked up with with a farmer um, in Marandellas. His name was Rolf Walschutz, which was a an, he was an Austrian. Funny story there. Um, they had been out, they were born Rhodesians, and um, his brother had the adjoining farm to him. His farm was, um, Rolf's farm was called um, Mere Estates, and the farm next to him was Wiltshire Estates. And Wiltshire was run by his brother, who was called Franz Walschutz, and he tried to get into the British army when, when, when the war broke out, and they wouldn't have him because he had too, too Germanic a name. So he changed his name to Forrester, because Walschutz, I believe, means Forrester in, in Austria. So he then became Captain Franz Forrester and he went through the war. He entered the war as a captain and he came back home. And then you had two brothers, one Franz Forrester and the other one Rolf Walschutz, um, blood brothers with different names. And um, we grew up on mere estates with Rolf Walschutz. So, so that's, that's how I got into Rhodesia. I was then, I was then seven or eight years old and uh, I started my career there. I don't think that my mother, who was a little Scots lassie, really knew what hit her because I took to the bush like a monkey. Um, she never saw me. Uh, I had to go to boarding school straight away. So that meant I had nine months, three times three months. And uh, we had three weeks at home during, during, during the year and six weeks at Christmas time. But she never saw me then because by the time she got up in the morning, I was gone and into the bush and I was playing around with all the little pickings and we were setting snares to catch dossies and uh, rock fall traps to catch cane rats and all of that we ate. 
and um, it was it was great. The, the skins from the dossies we caught, we gave to to my little black friend's uh, mother. Uh, we gave the the whole thing and and said she had to eat it because um, that is what my father said. If you're killing anything, you've got to eat it. So of course the black people on the farm were very appreciative of the fact I was providing them with dossies, which was like a big rabbit. And and unbeknown to me, she kept all the skins. Then um, when we, we were leaving the farm several years later to move up to Karoi to a new farm up there, uh, she presented me with a dossie Karos. <laughs> so um, that's, how, that's how I grew up in Rhodesia. And uh, um, I, I remember at 12 years old, uh, I'd been hunting with, with my other young, young friends who were also had been were born Rhodesians, but my age. I'd gone out, I did my first hunt in the Marandellis area, north, north of Marandellis, where this guy's father shot a, shot a diker, and I helped him skin it and gut it and all the funny things that you weren't supposed to do as a gentleman young boy. And um, it hooked me for life. And I just, it, it, uh, Easter time, when we were allowed to come home from school for, for the Easter holidays, I never came home. I went up with all my friends who had fathers who had tutus. So my mother never saw us, never saw me. And um, then uh, at, when age 12, my dad says, well, the only time we're going to see this lad of ours is if we give him a tutu. So that's what he did. He gave me a tutu. And uh, I grew up with a fishing rod in one hand, a tutu in the other. And my father said to me on one condition, in those days there were battered eagles and vultures flying all around Marandellas. And um, he said to me, whatever you shoot, you've got to eat. So that means these big birds that you see flying around the vultures, you can't shoot them because you're not going to eat them. So pick things that you that you can eat if you want to shoot them. So I was shot doves and and all the dussies for for my my little black friend's uh, parents and all this sort of thing. And that's that's how I grew up. Um, as I said, with a fishing rod in one hand and a rifle in the other. Um, when I went to to senior school, that was right the other side of the country at Plumtree. And um, it wasn't long before I met hooligans there at Plumtree who were just like me. And uh, we started collecting birds' eggs. I, I eventually ended up with a fantastic egg collection, uh, which is now registered um, with the, the Institute of Zoology in Los Angeles in America. It's one of the biggest egg collections that came out of Africa. Wow. So it's in a good, good home now. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, we, it ended up with me taking my rifles to school, my other friends taking their rifles or shotguns to school. And on, a, on weekends, we were allowed to go out on what we called an exit. That meant on a Sunday after breakfast, we could get on our bicycles, which we called grids then. We were able to take our bicycles to boarding school. And a grid was a bicycle without mud guards. And um, so we took our grids and we went all over the country collecting birds' eggs, fishing, did a lot of fishing in the dams there for tilapia, bream, and, and also hunting. And um, I know that in my last year at Plumtree, which was 1956, um, between Easter and Rhodes and Founders, my friends and I shot six kudu bulls and we took all the meat back to the hospital. At night, we went out, we brought the meat in as close as we could. We, we, we cut the usable meat off the carcass and we gave what was left of the carcass to the local villagers who had helped us find the kudu on the weekend. So if we wanted to go and shoot another kudu, we went out there and they had already eaten half the kudu that we shot the previous weekend. And um, they would take us out and say, well, they've been in this area all week. We've been watching them. And then we would shoot another kudu and we'd cut all the meat off, bring the meat back, leave the, the main part of the carcass, which was 75% of the meat was on, that, on the bones. The local people enjoyed that. We came back with this. We, uh, uh, after we'd all gone to bed, my friend Tim, Tim Hughes and I would sneak out at night. We'd go to where we had hidden the meat in our, in our raincoats. We brought it back again. We took it into the ceiling of the washrooms where we had rigged up lights. We had cut through the conduit piping to get at the electricity so that we could put <laughs> lights on up there. And we had wires um, through the beams with, and we had wire hooks up there. We had big basins. We, we cut our, our meat into strips, into biltong strips. We salted it and peppered it, and we hung it up there um, on the wires. And uh, when it was ready, we, we, we lived like kings. <laughs> so, so that was all great. Also at Plumtree, I started um, 
I started what became a, a real hobby of mine. We started falconry. Uh, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to train a hawk, but we we quickly learned. Uh, uh, another friend of mine there, Dave Rushworth, who ended up being another game warden with us in um, uh, in national parks later. Uh, he came back. He and I started it with all sorts of little hawks, little goshawks, little sparrow hawks, and then one day he came back with a tawny eagle. He was also climbing top of trees and finding out what, what the eagles were laying and recording it all and recording all this data with the Ornithological Society there. He was very hot on that. And he went up one day on a big tawny eagle's nest. Now, tawny eagle's like a small golden eagle, but it's still a very big bird. And uh, he climbed up on the nest and the eagle was on the, on the other side. It, it saw him come put his head over the nest and it fell backwards off the nest, gripped the, the sticks on the nest and fell over and broke a leg. So he had to bring this thing back to Plumtree. And, um, and, and there he, he, he had the, the vets where he was in the Fort Victoria area. They, they put a plaster cast on this eagle's leg, and they, but they had to cut all the feathers. A true eagle has got its tarsus, its leg is feathered right down to the feet. So that, they had to cut all that off and then they put a plaster cast on it so the leg would set. And the next school holidays, or the next school term after the holidays, he came back and he brought his eagle with him. And uh, meanwhile, he and I were flying African hawk eagles. And we advertised in the Bulawayo newspaper for wanted rabbits, feed your good home. And, uh, and we got these rabbits from people whose kids would got tired of their pets. And we brought them to school and we trained our African hawk eagles to catch these pet rabbits out on the, on the rugby field after school in the evenings. And we also brought this tawny eagle back. And eventually the, the leg healed, the bones stuck together on the tawny eagle and we cut the plaster off. And, um, and then we released it in, in, in the school grounds. It was a very small place, Plumtree. It wasn't a big town. The school was the biggest part of it. We let this eagle go and uh, it used to come back every day at lunchtime when we went down to the school to dining hall. Uh, the matron had there on our plate a lump of steak, which she provided for the tawny eagle, which we had to feed after lunch every day. So we then went outside every day after lunch, and the tawny eagle was flying around waiting, high up, went high up into the sky. And uh, we put the meat down, and the tawny eagle would come down. Eventually, we could put the meat on our gauntlets, on our fists, and put it up, and it would come down on, onto the fists. And we had great fun hunting like this. We hunted guinea fowl and all sorts of things with the hawk eagles. And then one day, we, we also had to do cadets there. Every Tuesday and every Thursday, we had cadets. And everyone had to march up and down. And we'll go down to the range and learn how to shoot a three or three on the range. And um, one of the young um, sergeants from the staff corps who was, who was um, teaching us how to, how to do square, square marching and what have you, uh, he saw us with our hawk eagles on our hand. We were going out to fly. A friend of mine used to go take a gauntlet and stand the other side of the rugby field, and we'd put some, some food on our fist and throw it up, and the hawk eagles would fly off my fist across the rugby field and go and sit on his fist and eat it. And then, then I would put some in meat, and then it would fly back to me, and this is how we trained our hawks. And this guy, with this soldier guy, I mean, he was an adult man. He... Um, was absolutely intrigued with this. And he said, how do you do it? I mean, where do you get your birds from? We said, well, these were babies. We got them out of the nest and, uh, and we reared them and, and, and now we're training it. The only life it knows is with us. So he says, well, I've been absolutely fascinated. He said, can you train any bird? So we said, yes. Um, the, if you get little ones out of the nest, they're called Iases. If you get them as adults, they're called Haggards. These are peregrine falcons terminology. But you can, you can train virtually anything at any time of its life. And he looked up and he saw this eagle flying up, up above us. And he says, you see that one up there? Can you catch that one and train it? So we said, yes, of course we can. And I looked up and there I could see its white leg because all the feathers, brown feathers have been cut off its leg for the plaster. And I knew that was our tawny eagle flying up there. Now, he didn't know that. And this is the sort of thing that happens once in a blue moon and you can't, you can't stop doing it. You, you, you can't avoid taking advantage of this situation. So we said, yeah, it's easy. We can train that one. Easy piece of pie. He said, well, what do you do? He said, I'll show you. So I said to my friend, Jimmy, you take my hawk and put it on his fist. And you keep it over there. And I took a, a lump of meat and put it on my fist. And I walked out from the side of the field and I held my fist up and I shouted, hey! And this eagle, it was a big eagle. A tawny eagles are big eagles. 
and it fell to its wings and it came down and it landed on my fist and it took the meat and I let it go. And I looked at the soldier's eyes. They were as big as saucers. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. Now, when do you get an opportunity like that to do something like that? What a so, story. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's where my falconry started. It formed a major part of my life later on. Um, but we used to sneak our rifles and our shotgun in. I was, we had, other than fishing, when we used to bring the fish back that we caught on a Sunday and fillet them, and then we take a whole big basin load of this into the cook matron. How the cook matron survived us, I don't know, but she did. I think she enjoyed it. But she would cook a whole big bowl of these fillets of these things, which we all ate with our fingers. And we, we were in tables of 10. And everybody wanted to be on our table because it always got extra grub. So if it wasn't fish. We had um, back legs of daka, which she cooked for us, little, a little antelope called a daka, because we would shoot them as well. Or we had fillets of kudu and all, all sorts of things. Or we had biltong, because, of course, we lived on biltong. Um, people who don't know the, um, the South African hunter know, doesn't know what biltong is. They call it jerky in America, but American jerky is not the same as mm. Southern African biltong. It's, no, it's very different. Mm. Anyway, we, we, we lived like kings there. What, what happened on, on one occasion was that the year before I left Plumtree, I wrote, a, I wrote an article for the school magazine, which I called The Joys of Falconry. And there was a young British school teacher who had just got married and come out with his wife. He had a gorgeous um, wife. He, his name was Tony Good, Tony Goodall. His wife was Moira. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, was absolutely intrigued with falconry. And when he read this, he, he went to uh, Prince Edward's school in Salisbury. When he saw this thing in the magazine, he, he arranged it. He found out that I was going to be at Plumtree for another year. And he thought he wanted to learn how to fly falcons or how to fly falconry birds. Um, so he arranged a transfer from Prince Edward to Plumtree for the next beginning of the next year so that I could teach him how to do falconry. Well, he, um, he came down and we taught him what we took him out with us. And we used his motor car. He took us out at weekends to go hunting guinea fowl and all sorts of things. And, uh, uh, he he was he was really became a great pal of ours, a real great pal. And uh, then we 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 often had we had great difficulties hiding our weapons when we were there. And my my housemaster didn't like me at all. He was my Latin master. I didn't like Latin either. Um, <laughs> uh, I, one of the reasons he didn't he didn't like um, he didn't particularly like me was because I went out one day and I came back with a, a black eagle. Now, black eagle is, is, virt is almost as big as a, as a golden eagle. They, they're a little bit more delicate, but they are huge, huge birds. And I caught this. It was sitting on an egg in its nest, and I um, managed to catch it on the nest. That's another story altogether. And I brought it back to school. Now, I was going to try and train this eagle. It was so heavy that I had to have a pole, a tea pole, to hold on, on my hand, which, which I could put down on the ground and keep my hand like that with my eagle sitting on it because it was so heavy. I couldn't hold it without that because I got pains in my back. It was so sore. And um, shortly after I got it, I, uh, I had it on a log behind our house, our, 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 our hostel, and it was sitting on a log there and I would feed it, I would try to feed it meat from the kitchen, but it wasn't having any of this. It was just sat there stubbornly with a, like, with a sour face. It must've been a female. And, um, then what happened was, was uh, my housemaster had two golden cocker spaniels, which two both females, and he bred them and took them to Bulawayo, 60 miles away, to be served when they came on heat. And he, he made a lot of money out of little golden, uh, golden cocker spaniel puppies. Anyway, I, after lunch, we put the meat down for the eagle. It just sat there and ignored it. And then we went up. We were in the senior dormitory then, which overlooked this place where the eagle was. It was covered in a big hedge. And... Uh, and what happened, while we were all resting there, we had half an hour to rest before we had to go out and play our sports. Um, this dog came, one of my head housemaster's dogs came around, sniffing, <laughs> they could smell the meat. So it whipped in there to go and, and then saw the meat, it just ignored the eagle and it put his mouth on top of the meat to pull it and the eagle just grabbed it. <laughs> its feet, one foot was bigger than my hand. <laughs> and it, its back talon was three and a half inches long to give you some idea of the size of those toes. And it had this dog. And we heard this 
god awful level of squealing and howling and what have you outside and all the boys in the dormitory ran outside and they they looked outside and there they saw this eagle was having a good go at the dog so my friend Kim and I ran down the stairs and we went outside and we grabbed we grabbed this eagle off the dog and I held the one foot and I had to prise the toes open my friend held the other toe and the eagle was lying back like this while it had the dog there and by now the dog was was quiet and it was still and we were, I was worried it was dead. Anyway, we managed to get the we managed to get the the claws open, the, the toes open. The dog fell plonk on the ground, and uh, then I said to Tim, "Have you got your penknife on you?" He said, "Yes." What are you going to do? I said, "I'm going to cut its leather jesses and I'm going to let this eagle go. It's too big for me." I realized it was too big for me. We caught it, but I knew then I was in big big trouble with my housemaster. I knew that. So anyway, I took this eagle, eagle and I threw it over the hedge which was quite an undertaking. It opened its wings and it fell down the other side. So I ran around. Now, everybody was supposed to be asleep on their bed. I ran around the outside and I looked down the road that went down where the, the, the prefects had their, had their common room. And coming out of the common room was the headmaster. The headmaster was a dumpy little man with a big tummy. And he came out and I saw him close the gate behind him. And I saw my eagle flying just above the ground beating his wings were just beating the dust off the road because it was a dirt road and it flew straight towards him and of course <laughs> it didn't have the speed to, to get altitude so it was beating to try and get altitude and he was standing there like this looking at it wondering what to do with this eagle flying down towards him and he ducked at the last minute the eagle lifted its wing over his head and then the eagle took off and it flew away so that that was that story that was that story but then what happened was then what happened was um we took the dog into into our study at the back of the house. The, the wounded got, dog. The wounded dog. It was just quiet. It just lay there and it was paralyzed. Anyway, we got a bucket of hot water and hot towels and he kept massaging it and everything. And then when when everybody got up from from rest, they had to go and, and march up and down and play cadets, play soldiers, you see. And our headmaster, Tumpty Turner was his name, um, Mr. Turner. Captain Turner, as he called himself, um, he was down there with the cadets and he didn't know what had happened to his dog. When he came back from the cadets, I told Tim, you go and do the cadets. Please tell, tell Tumpty that, that I've got diarrhea and I, I can't possibly come and do, do cadets this afternoon, which he did and that was accepted. Meanwhile, I'm massaging this guy's dog. And uh, <laughs> then everybody comes back and Tumpty wanders around outside and he says in a plaintive little voice, he was saying, has anybody seen Gina? Gina hasn't been at home ever since before lunch. And she went on and on like this, you see. And then the other dog sniffed at the bottom and I could see from the sun, the shade coming in, its nose was right under our, our, our study door, which I'd locked. And he knocked on the door. Is anybody in there? No, but the do other dog still says, sniffing there. So we, I meanwhile was holding his other dog by the nose like this, so it wouldn't whimper or anything. And eventually he went off looking for his dog somewhere else. And finally we got this dog to be able to stand on its two back feet. And then, um, this isn't about me. This is about some little adventures when I was at school. So, um, anyway, round about lunchtime, uh, supper time, we all had to get into a crocodile. Two, two lines of, of kids walking down to the to the dining room to go and have have dinner and so we for, wait till, till the last minute and when the gong went we had to go and get in the crocodile I grabbed this little dog and I ran ran around the not far from where my study was was the open kitchen door because the bottom of the of the hostel was a flatlet for the for the housemaster and uh, the ki kitchen door was open so I took this little dog and I pushed it through through the kitchen door into the kitchen and it hobbled around and inside was on its feet anyway and I rushed through the house got into the got into the crocodile went back down to um down to the to the hostel to, to the dining room and I had my supper but well, after supper it was ritual for us to go to the prep room which was a room on on the on the ground floor and there the housemaster would address us the prayers would be said and he would then give us some exciting news that he'd had during the day normally something like that happened Anyway, after the prayer, he, he in, and the whole hostel was sitting in this room. Um, so there were about 60 boys sitting in this one room. And they had all seen what had happened with the dog down there in the afternoon. They knew that the eagle had caught the dog. And they were saying, you're going to get into trouble, boy. <laughs> you're in big trouble. Anyway, he said, an extraordinary thing happened 
when you guys were at in the dining room, he said a leopard came around behind our house and it tried to catch our little dog. And our little dog stood up and fought with it bravely and it chased the leopard away. <laughs> but it's got holes all over it where the claws of the leopard went in. And um, <laughs> he says, tomorrow we're going to have to take it all the way to Bulawayo, 60 miles to a vet to get the vet to have a look at it because we don't know whether the leopard's claws were septic or not. So... <laughs> Anyway, all the boys were dumbstruck listening to this because they knew what had happened. And I looked at my friend Tim and I said, big fire, boom, we're home and dry. Because after that story, he will never, ever be able to, he'll never accept the truth after that. So those, those are my sort of escapades that I had at school. Fascinating. Uh, I, I had a wonderful school, absolute wonderful schooling. It was, it, Plumtree was 60 miles out of town. Yeah. Right in the bush. It was the exact right place for me to be. Ron, lots of lots of great uh, Rhodesians came from that school, I must say. Uh, yes, it's amazing reservoir of talent and um, exceptional people. So, after after school, what then? After school, um, that was in in 1956 was my last year at school, and um, we had to then. Do, do a, a military commitment. We could either do six months in the army or join the police force, um, which I think had a, a commitment for three years, um, or, or join the Air Force. And because of my dad's link with the Air Force, I decided to join the Air Force. So I joined the Air Force and, and became a, a, a trainee pilot. And uh, until I tried to fly an airplane underground and discovered that they weren't designed to do that. <laughs> so I was invalided out of the Air Force, but quickly recovered from that. And, um, and then I started my adventures. I tried, I tried farming as a, an assistant tobacco farmer um, after I left school. It didn't fit my, my personality. So, but then a, a friend of mine called Mike Reynolds had discovered a copper claims on the Angua River about um, about 100 miles north of, or through the bushes uh, from Karoi. And we walked down there, there were no roads. We walked down there and uh, with, uh, with 20 um, black guys with big packs on their heads, like the good old trails of uh, colonial Africa. We walked down to the Angwa. We then, uh, the, the country was very steep. And we cut a, 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 um, a platform on, on the side of the hill overlooking the river where we built, uh, built our camp. There was another one for the black people. The porters then became our, our employees down there. And we were then going to open up this, this, this copper mine, which incidentally had been mined by, um, by what the Rhodesians called the ancients. These are the people that they say built the Zimbabwe ruins and did all the 2,000 square miles of terracing in the Nyanga Mountains, which is not true. It's a lot more exciting than that, but that's another story. And uh, we opened up the copper mine and it was my job to, to feed the, everybody in camp. There was an old man there, Mike Reynolds' father-in-law called Zuk Nesbitt, who was a, had been a colonel in the, in the previous war. And um, he and I were the only two white people there, were miles from nowhere. But I had to feed everybody. So I took a, a, an old 303 SM, SMLE rifle with a, had a tube in the barrel down, chambered down to Tutu Hornet. And every week I shot bushbuck for the, uh, for, for the camp. Or we, because I was blasting a road out there, we blasted the road from the main road down there, which is a distance of, I don't know, about 54 miles, I think it was. Uh, I blasted all the road. And I was then only, what, um, I was about 18. Uh, I, I didn't have a blasting license, but but I did the blasting anyway. Zook told me what to do, so I did it. And we had guys with hammers and chisel knocking the holes in the rock that we wanted to blast away. And uh, so then we we took we got the road out, and we, we blasted these big river pools there to get fish at the bottom. When we when the bushbuck became too sly, and we didn't get our bushbuck, we had to give feed on something. So we blasted the rivers with dynamite, which is a terrible thing to do one or two pools that we didn't do the whole river but then we went down and we had to go into the water most of the fish were at the bottom of, of the pool um, and i said to all the black guys with me come down with me and let's get all these big ones all the big one big fish are at the bottom of the pool and you could see them at the bottom after all the mud had 
been washed downstream, it, the water was very clear. And they said, no ways, we're not coming in the water. We're not mad like you Makiwas, like you white men are. There's a crocodile lives in this pool, we've seen him. We're not going in there. And I said, what crocodile? I said, I shot a crocodile here, which I had done the previous week. I said, that was your crocodile, but there's no more in there, but the fish are here. So I said, no, we're not stupid. We're not going in there. So I went in with a sack and a rope with rocks in the bottom of the sack to take us down to the pool. We picked up all, they're all lying upside down with their bellies facing and their gills moving. We picked them up and filled up the bag. We yanked on the string. They pulled it up. They chucked it in again. I went down and kept going. I eventually came to a place where this crocodile, there was a crocodile then. It was lying, it was about a nine footer. It was lying on the bottom of the pool and it was lying doggo. It had been shattered by the blasting as well. Thank goodness for that. Um, because the next thing I knew was I saw this croc get up in front of me because the water was clear enough. I got smacked across the ribs with its tail and it shot off to the far end of the pool. Mm. And, you know, I ended up being the first person in 2000 years to have got up and run across the top of water. And I tell you, I don't know how I got to the edge of that bank, but <laughs> there was nothing stopping me. My feet were going pata kata kata on top of the water and I was <laughs> out of it. So we had all sorts of fun ideas like that or adventures like that. And then, and then how did you find your way to national parks, Ron? Well, the United the UK um, Atomic Energy Authority were opening up beryllium mines in the country because they needed crucibles to put radioactive material for their um, um, nuclear energy plants. And beryllium gives off, if you put stainless steel or something like that in, it either gives a negative or a positive feed off, electrical feed off from it. But when you use beryllium, beryllium just threw off neutrons. So it didn't, they didn't have any, any lead offs to take, any um, electrical buildups. Um, so they, but before they converted everything to, to beryllium, we had to find out how much beryllium there was. And therefore, because I've been doing exactly the same thing with the copper, opening up the copper mine, I had to open up beryllium mines now, old beryllium mines, just to find out how many there were. So I got employed by the UK Atomic Energy Authority. And from there in, in the in the um, in the Matoka district on the east eastern side up against the Mozambique border, uh, uh, when I was there, the we employed people to dig trenches so that we do do sampling and things like that. And there um, over a six month period as a young man of 18, um, I, shot, um, I shot one leopard on the, on the Angwa and I shot another six where we were with the UK Atomic Energy Authority and all the skins went to my mother for her to show off what a bright sun she had, you see. <laughs> but it, everything, everything was wild. It was wild, wild, wild. You could buy, it, you could buy an elephant license for two pounds. If, as long as you shot the elephant in the in the in the Tetsi fly corridor areas, and uh, I didn't have two pounds, so I, I shot an elephant when I was there, eighteen years old, um, with a nine point three um, um, Norma rifle, um, which was my first elephant. It wasn't a very very good hunt, but it, it was a hunt, and I got my elephant. Um, that's another long story. So I'd had a lot of hunting. I used to hunt at weekends because all the staff, according to the British office in Salisbury, they said, these guys have to have rest and recreation time, so they've got to be let off every weekend. They would rather have worked over the weekend and made extra money, but head office weren't going to allow that. But that allowed me the whole of every weekend to go hunting, which was great. And, and then um, I, I knew the director of national parks. He had two sons in my house, or the house that I was into, Lloyd House at Plumtree. I got to know him at Plumtree, because at Plumtree, I was a great athlete. I run, won the Victor Ladorum on all three of my age categories. I played first 15 rugby, I played first 11 hockey. Um, so he knew who I was. When I, when I, as soon as I got the opportunity, I went to see him in Salisbury. He was the director of National Parks. And I said, listen, Mr. Stewart, I want a job in National Parks as a game ranger. He said, but you've got to be 22 years old. And how old are you? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm 19, 19 years. He said, well, you can't do that now. You're going to have to go and do something else. So I said, no, I said, he said, you're going to have to go and, uh, and learn how to build. You're going to have to learn how to hunt. You're going to have to learn how to do all these different things. So I, I remember everything he said. And the big thing that he said was I had to learn how to hunt because I may have to be able to do that in national parks, hunting crop raiding elephants and things like this. So um, every animal I shot, I photographed at length. 
and I had a big album with all the animals that I had shot since I'd, since, since I'd left school. That included uh, a whole lot of leopards and one elephant, um, a water buck and a number of other things. And I took all this into him, a big album, and I put it and said, you said, these are the things I have to do there. I've done them. Every single thing he asked me to do, I photographed showing him that I had done them because I wanted that job. And uh, he, he, I gave him enough, enough criminal evidence there to put me in jail for six years. <laughs> Anyway, he, he, he then called in his deputy and he says, listen, I can't handle this guy anymore. He says, I know him too well. I want you to have a good look at this, at this guy. Now, he, he then had to endure me going through all the photographs with him as, a, as the deputy director. And uh, he, then, he then said, what else have you done? I said, he said, yeah, we don't done anything with the museum. I said, yes, I know Dr. Ray Smithers, who was the director of, of the National Museums. He said, really? And, and what about him? Well, he said, I said, um, I've shot the first clawless otters ever to be found in the country. I shot them and I gave them to the museum. I've shot seven or, seven or eight different bird species, which are all specimens in the museum now. And they, they're brand new. They'd never been known in Rhodesia at that time. And um, I said, uh, he, he knows about me. So, and I got on very well with Ray Smithers. So unbeknown to me, but Ray Smithers told me later, he phoned up Ray Smithers and he says to him, What's this guy Ron Thompson like? Um, is he would he would he be a good candidate for national parks? He said, "Listen, listen, you got him, take him." He says, "You won't get a guy like this again, because he has done so much for the ornithological things and everything in the museum." So they made a special purse for me. Huh? It was um, it was I was the first cadet game ranger in national parks, and uh, I I was then I then I had to leave the the job I was in with the UK authority because um, they had decided not to do beryllium after all. So I then went up and I was doing diamond drilling, getting cores of stuff for the um, Nkula Falls hydroelectric scheme in, in um, Nyasaland. And while I was there, I got notification that I'd been accepted into national parks. So on my way back, I flew next, who would sit next to me it was in an old DC-3 Dakota aircraft which was the Central African Airways prime um, aircraft at the time. And who was sitting next to me but Sir Roy Walensky. I'm and listening. he and I, he was the Prime Minister of the Federation. Yes. So we flew all the way back. We had a wonderful chat together. And we developed a friendship as a consequence of this little kid and this big fat man, um, the, 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 the most senior politician in the, in, in the Federation. Anyway, I then went down. I was posted to, I wanted Wanky. Uh, I was posted to, to the Metopus, and the first thing we had to do in the Metopus was to start building a, uh, a, a paddock, or a, uh, how would we, one would call it, a, um, a farm inside the Metopus National Park to accept young animals that we were going to get from Wanky, Wanky National Park, which was about 200 miles away. And... Um, when we had got the perimeter fence done, I was then sent up to go and, and, and pick up the, the animals which the staff in Wanky are supposed to have caught at Ngamo. And they were caught them by Land Rover. In those days, there were no drugs, there was no nets, there was no nothing like that. What we did, we just got into strip down Land Rovers. We raced after the wildebeest, elan, buffalo, giraffe, you name it. We, we caught all these animals with what we called funk stock. We had long sticks, long thin mm -hmm. sticks with a rope, a noose on the end of it. And the, and the rope coming through to our hands and we raced after these things out on the open plains and we either caught it when the back legs were coming up we put the noose around the back leg or over the head or whatever it was and then we took then we slowed down and then we all jumped out and grabbed it and held it and put it down we we even we were in the middle of the buffalo herds catching selecting young buffalo heifers and when what have you to to catch and then we put them into pens at Ngama. when we had enough we loaded them into into the lorries and we took them down to the Metropolis and released them there. And the, the first ones we took down were, were wildebeest and zebra, buffalo, giraffe, <laughs> and a few other things like that. And uh, the first thing that happened when we got there was that the, the, the leopards, the, the Metropolis is a great big um, jumble of granite hills. It's the most beautiful national park in the country, I think. But it's full of dussies, the little hyrax, the coney of the Bible, and um, the leopards were living on them. But there were also 
people living on in, in, inside the park and they had cattle, sheep and goats and they were getting their stock killed by the leopards. Then the leopards started eating the animals we had brought in from Wanky. And we had to go up and catch them all again because we were just feeding breakfast to the leopards. So then a decision was made that we would, um, we would shoot all the leopards in the game park area that we had reserved. And, uh, and, and it was also my job to, to hunt down the leopards that were killing the cattle uh, and the sheep and the goats of the Mandabili people who were also living in, in, in allocated areas of the park. Mm -hmm. They were all moved out later. The park was reduced in size and then we were able to separate the, the leopards from everything. But I ended up shooting a whole handful of, of extra leopards. I had experience with leopards. So um, I spent 11 months in, in the Matopas, uh, virtually hunting leopards practically every night, going out and, and watching. We had some wonderful experiences there. And we eventually reduced the numbers of leopards in the, in the area to, to get our young animals to survive. And as a consequence of that, um, the, the Matopas National Park is now full of the same kind of game animals you get in Wanky National Park because we, we successfully reintroduced them through that, but it was at the cost of the leopards. But of course, the leopards are cats, they breed like cats, and they're just as many now as they were when we started. And then I was, I was worried, worrying away at a bone, and that is I wanted to get to Wanky, I wanted to transfer to Wanky. And I think I probably made a hell of a noose of myself, nu nuisance of myself, because eventually they, they eventually sent me to Wanky. And, uh, uh, the boss man of Wanky at the time, Ted Davison, who was the, the original man who started Wanky, was still there. I was the last game ranger to work under him. And he and I got on like a house on fire because he also, even then, at his age, and he was near retirement, he was still collecting bird's eggs. Really? Yeah. So he and I had something in common. Mm -hmm. And he also knew Ray Smithers from the museum very well. And they had something else in common. So I actually, when I got to Wanky, I just fell into a groove that was waiting for me. Where, where, how, did, where, you run? where did you start? Man, at at Mancamp? Mancamp. Okay, yeah. And at Mancamp, there was Ted Davison to begin with for a few months. He was only there for four or five months before he left. And he, took, he was appointed deputy director in Salisbury, which must have killed his goat because he'd been in the bush all his life. Um, and then the, the boss man of Main Camp was Bruce Austin. He then became the boss man of the, of the park as a whole. Harry Canton was there. He was he was in charge of all the mechanical work in the boreholes for the game water supplies. And there was Tim Braybrook, who was a young game ranger that I had actually been at school with. He was more senior to me, but we knew each other from Plumtree. And, and there was me. And there was also another guy who was in charge of tourism and an assistant tourist officer who was there only for the tourist season. Wanky was then open only for six months of the year to tourism. So there were four, four officers, field officers, one who was tied up with administration, one who was tied up with fixing all the water supplies and everything. And Tim Braverg and I was two young game rangers and we were youngsters then. And it was our job to attend to all the problem animals that, that we, we had to deal with. And these were elephants that were all, we were surrounded by, by tribal areas. And the elephants used to leave the park during the rains and go out and raid these people's crops. Mm -hmm. And the, the lions would go out, lions which were evicted by the prides. As soon as, as soon as a lion reaches the age of, of 22 to 24 months, the, the adult lions in a pride kick them out of the pride and they have to go and find their own way. And, and, and wherever they go, there are other lions which chase them from pillar to post. Mm -hmm. So these young lions leave the park, they go out onto the farms or into the tribal areas where they live on, on the fat of the land on killing cattle and sheep and goats. And sometimes people too. I've shot six man-eating lions in my, in my career. And um, uh, it was Tim and I who had to go out and, and uh, uh, do, do the crop rating control and the stock killer control. And we were almost exclusively tied up in that, in that kind of venture. We did a number of other works in the, in the, in the park, but mo most of our time was, was spent doing that. And then in 1960, the end of 1960, we had, I, I did my first game count at Wanky. Now game count is when people are invited down into the park to come and count the animals that are drinking at the water holes. It's at, at the height of the dry season, that is in October, um, when every animal we thought in the park would, would have to go down and drink. We, um, we started the count at 12 o'clock on the, on the day of the full moon in October. 
And then we counted the animals that went down to water for 24 hours. So it went through the whole night and down to 12 o'clock the next day. And we counted everything that came down. If I heard an elephant now, now in the full moon up there, the, the air was so, so, so clear. With a pair of binoculars, you could almost see this, the same as you could during the day. The, 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 the lighting was so good. And we counted and everything from a jackal upwards. Ron, okay, what year, what, what year was this roughly, the first game? 60. 60. 60. 1960. And just, um, just tell us, what, what was the estimated population, elephant population of Wanky then? The actual count, when we'd finished, we had to fill in the forms and everything. Everybody did it. And we had the, we had the whole of the, of the National Parks Board come down, including the Chief Justice, Sir Hugh Beadle. He came, he was the chairman of the Parks Board. Everybody was there. And um, when we got all the, all the things together and we counted them all up, we counted 3,500 elephants in the whole of Wanky. Then there were only 14, only 14 water holes. So we, we counted every bit of water and we were pretty sure that that, 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 that was accurate. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the interesting thing about it is this, is that the, 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 the board members were shrewd. I was still a very young game ranger. I was only 20 years old then. Uh, or 21, 21. I just turned, I just turned 21. And um, so I, well, I was all ears rather than all mouth. Uh, um, I was invited to a special board meeting they had done and Sir Hugh Beadle, um, the chief justice in the land who was there, and he and I became great friends too. We had a lot in common. He was a great elephant hunter. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, we, we've got a decision to make. We, we've counted these elephants because we want to be able to manage them. Now, these young, these young people here have taken us around and shown us that the elephants are absolutely demolishing the habitats in the park. The mukwa trees, the Terracopus angolensis, more, more than, than 90, no, I would say more than 80% of all the mukwa trees in Wanki in those days was lying on its back. The elephants had just pushed them over. Elephants don't always push trees over because they want to eat them. They push them over. There are other reasons why they do it. Um, particularly the young bulls when they're looking for rank, they want to push trees over to say to their mates, look what a strong boy am I, I'm bigger than you are, and therefore they get higher rank. And that does a, a hell of a lot more damage to the woodlands than just eating. A lot of people don't realize that, but, th but that activity kills a lot more trees than eating. But all the acacias were going down, they were knocking all the big umlala palm trees. It was just a mess. And he said, we've got to do something about these elephants. What is the carrying capacity for Wanky? Elephant carrying capacity, nobody knew. Even the top scientists who were there, like Ray Smithers, he hadn't a clue what it was. Um, nobody had ever given him that kind of question before. So he says, well, I'll tell you what I know is that 3,500 uh, 3, elephants is more elephants than Wanky can carry sustainably because otherwise they wouldn't be knocking all the trees down. That is the indicator that we've got too many elephants. He says, if nobody can tell me what the carrying capacity is, and that is what we should have kept, kept the elephants at, if nobody can tell me what it is, I'm going to make a, a decision on behalf of the board, if you would let me do so. He says, I want these young whippersnappers here to go out when we go back, and I want them to, to reduce the elephant population from 3,500 to 2,500. Because 2,500, 2,500, he says, might be the carrying capacity. Or we take a thousand off, we've got two and a half thousand left, there's still a lot of elephants, but the, at least the trees will not be being pushed over. So the board agreed to that, except they made one proviso. They said that Wanki is a national park, it is a sanctuary for elephants. We must not let the elephants think it is not a sanctuary for them. So we want to maintain the sanctity of Wanki. That means if you're going to shoot these elephants, all the elephants that you shoot must be shot outside the boundaries of the park. Now, there was no fence boundary or anything. It was just mm -hmm. a demarcated line in those days. And any elephant that crossed that was fair game, you can shoot it. And if, if you find the breeding herds there, you've got to learn how to handle taking out the breeding herds. So you're going to have to take out breeding herds. When you do so, you take out the entire breeding herd. Because then you're not leaving elephants running around that have had any experience of being killed by, by, white, by the white man. And we don't want to lose that. And, and that is what happened in 1960, instructions from the board. Ron, and just if I, can, if I can jump in there, we're, we, we're going a, a bit ahead in terms of the stuff I wanted to talk to you about. But So they figured out reduced to 2,500 then in 1960. 
Just, yes. uh, just, I just want to throw this in at this point. What, what is the estimated population of Wanky today? <laughs> that is something I, I wanted to bring in later. But anyway, let's let's tell you now. We can mix it all up. Yeah. The um, e- elephants are funny things. In October, when they're all packed together, you can see them all coming to the water every day. They come to the water every day, and it's a very good time to go to Wanky to see elephants because you will always see them. The minute the very first thunderstorm hits the skies, the very next day, you go out and you will not see an elephant for weeks and weeks and weeks. They just disperse. Because as soon as the first rainstorm hits an area, immediately the the leaves that are budding um, on, on the branches burst into leaf and then the elephants are out there to go and feed on them. And you literally, it's not just the elephants, all sorts of other animals do this as well. They just, the buff, big buffalo herd split up and they just disperse. But the elephants particularly, which is what we are more worried about today than anything else. So depending upon where your rain falls, the elephants are very susceptible to following rainstorms. And depending on during the year where the most rain falls, your elephants go to those areas. And your carrying capacity in Wanky, if it is two and a half thousand, that's one elephant per two square miles. Wanky is 5,000 square miles. It's not a, not a dense population. They can come in or stay out depending upon where, where the rain has fallen, fallen the best. And the counts can vary anything from about 130,000 to, so no, no, sorry, from 30,000 to 80,000. So if we suck our thumbs and say that the average is probably somewhere in the region of about 50,000, that is probably as near as, you, as you're going to get to what the actual figure is. Um, it, they're, 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 not easy, they're not easy animals to count. They are easy if you if the conditions are right, but um, but they move around a lot. So there are formulas that you can use and put in scientific data and and, and come up with estimated populations or wherever elephants occur. But I think it's a fairly good bet to say that there are probably no less than thirty thousand elephants in the dry season inside Wanky, and and no more than eighty thousand, and let's just call it fifty thousand. Um, for, for ease of, of understanding the problem. That means that Wanky National Park today, if the 2,500 carrying, carrying capacity is correct, Wanky is carrying 20 times more elephants than the habitats can sustainably support. And that is the biggest problem that we have with elephants all over Southern Africa. It's not just Wanky, but all over Southern Africa. Botswana, Botswana elephant population is a mega population. It includes the, the elephants of, of Wanky, it includes southern Zambia, it includes southern southeastern Angola and northeastern Namibia mm-hmm. and the whole of Botswana and, and Ngami land and then right the way down to the Limpopo River. Um, and that total population probably numbers in excess of 200,000. Yeah. It's a very big, vast area. I have just, last month, last, last October, I have just done a survey and filmed um, all the, the habitats in Kruger National Park from the southern point to the northernmost point to see just what impact the elephants are having on the habitats in Kruger. And we wanted to do the same with Wanki and with the Ghana Rajor. I was in, I've been in charge of both those national parks. Um, but unfortunately, COVID would not allow us to get through the borders. But we did have full, um, uh, a full survey opportunity from Cherby River in Botswana, right the way through Botswana down to the Murimi. And we, we, we didn't count elephants. We weren't, we weren't there to count elephants. What we were doing, we were recording the effect of the elephants on their habitat. That is, in other words, the damage that the elephants were doing to their habitats. And we've got all that on film. Right at this moment, we are putting together the first of two films on this. One will be on Kruger National Park. The other one will be in, in Botswana. So the damage, the damage is enormous, um, absolutely enormous. The, and, and what is happening in Kruger at the same time, um, since 1960, Kruger National Park, which we've got better figures for for Kruger than we have for Wanky. Uh, since 1960 in Kruger, your elephants have reduced the top canopy trees in Kruger National Park by more than 95%. That means every single tree that is still standing in Kruger National Park today, in 1960, which is what is what's that? 30 years ago. Okay. 
40, 60, 60 years ago. Years ago. 60 years ago. There were 20 other trees standing next to it. And uh, at the moment, uh, I have worked out accurately the carrying capacity for Kruger National Park. And it is, it, it comes out at about three and a half thousand elephants per, per park as a whole. That is, again, roughly, funnily enough, roughly one elephant for two, two square miles, which is what we had for Wanky. So I think a lot of the, a lot of the national parks in Southern Africa, when they in the past, they have only made guesstimates because it's very difficult to, to determine what is a carrying capacity for elephant. How, how do you go about doing it? The only way you can really do it is to go into the park and to, and to account for every single tree, every single young treedling that is coming up and then see how, how they develop over 60 years in the face of, of a certain elephant pressure. And that's almost impossible to do. So we were lucky in Kruger to have a foolproof way of doing it, which I can discuss with you later if you like. Um, and it worked out at uh, three and a half thousand, between three and a half thousand and four thousand elephants, plus or minus um, 500. And at the moment, the, the, the best scientific um, account of the numbers of elephants in Kruger National Park today is, is 30,000. Uh, 30, for 34,000. And that was done by uh, a previous large mammal scientist called uh, Soli Joubert. And he was also a previous director of Kruger National Park. He estimates that the, the, the numbers of elephants in Kruger cannot be any less than, than, than 34,000. My estimate would have put it up to nearly 40,000. But, but that is just working on figures. He's actually worked, worked on a lot of other scientific stuff and he's a, he's a very good scientist. Ron, uh, so kid, it's uh, all a problem. Wherever elephants occur in Southern Africa, we've got a problem. Ron, uh, what I wanted to say at the outset, really, I don't know how many people alive today have had as much experience and gained as much knowledge of uh, what's actually happening in wildlife, and certainly in Southern Africa. So I consider you uh, one of the real experts on what is happening and, and the issue. Are your views and your, your calculations reaching the ears of any people in authority who actually understand how big this problem is? And, um, and are there any ideas about how to address it? Well, the answer to your question quite simply is no. And, and the reason is it, it's quite complex. The reason is, first of all, um, I don't have a scintillating professor's degree or anything like that. So, so I'm just a, a Johnny come lately sort of thing, but I have applied myself and I do have a university edu ed education in ecology. But most, most of what my knowledge is, in, in, is, is, is actually come from practical implications. Yeah, from the field. Yeah, in the field. A lot of scientists don't like the idea of reducing elephants in Kruger National Park, for example, from 30 odd thousand, although the scientists don't say there's 30,000. Again, that's another complex issue. They don't like the idea of reducing the numbers of elephants in Kruger, which in, uh, Kruger is known for its elephants, um, down to three or 4,000. And, and when they heard that I was, when the Kruger scientists heard that I was going in to do this film, they said, what the hell is Ron Thompson doing making a film in Kruger National Park? What does he want to do? So I've got a good friend within the staff of Kruger. And he said to them, why don't you just let him do what, he's do, what, what he wants to do and, and hear what he's got to say, and then maybe you'll learn something. He said, I don't know what he's doing or how he's going to do it. He says, but let him do it. And at least after that, we, we, maybe we will know a bit more about it. Yeah. It, was, it was on that basis, and I'm very thankful for that, that, I, that they tolerated me. And, and my good friend who is in there, um, um, Richard Sowry, is a senior ranger. He's got 20 years experience in Kruger. Uh, he took us to places where other people wouldn't have gone. And I wasn't, other than the fact that Richard was with us for a small while, I wouldn't have got to half the places in Kruger that I did get to, and I did get to film. Um, and of course, all that will come out in the film that we're making on it. He was telling me that there's a rumor. It is, it is probably best called a rumor in, in South Africa, that the scientists in Kruger don't want to cull elephants. And Richard says, that's not true. He says, he says, the problem is, is that every time 
the scientists say, listen, we think we're going to have to reduce the elephant. And they, the Kruger scientists claim that there are only 15,000 or 17,000 elephants in, in, the, in Kruger National Park. And that, I must tell you, is wrong. And Solly Joubert will also tell you that that is wrong. Um, and Richard himself said, I also believe that we're going to have to do it. He says, but, and the, he says the scientists in Kruger actually they, they have indicated that they also would like to do it. But every time somebody in officialdom in South Africa says we want to cull elephants, the animal rightists jump on their backs and say, if you people start culling elephants in South Africa, anywhere in South Africa, we will institute an international tourism boycott of your country because we believe the elephant is an endangered species, which is not true. In fact, there's no such thing as an endangered species. Like if you want to ask me that question later, do so. And the elephant is certainly not endangered or threatened in any way. If you, if you look at, the, at the, the numbers, Kruger National Park has got, in my opinion, 10 times too many elephants for the carrying capacity, against the carrying capacity. Um, Ghana Rajor, which I was in charge of for five and a half years, and I did a major population reduction elephant uh, operation there in 71 and 72, has currently got 14,000. If it has got the similar kind of carrying capacity that Kruger has got, then it should only be, able, it should only be carrying 1,000. Mm -hmm. Wanky National Park is carrying approximately 50,000. It should only be carrying 2,500. Botswana Botswana, and all the other surrounding areas are carrying 200,000. What are we going to do with all these elephants? How are we going to manage this? But if we don't, if we don't get in there and do something about this, these national parks, which are supposed to be holding our national heritage, they were appointed for, this, for the, the, the principal purpose of maintaining species diversity. All the habitats are changing. They're all being downgraded. We, are all, we have already lost several big tree species. Things like the Marshall Eagle in, in, in a lot of these areas will disappear because there are no big trees left for the marshals to breed in. The ground hornbills have, need big old trees that have got hollows in to breed. Those are all going by the way. The, the baobab trees, which were knocked out 94%, of the baobab trees in the Ghana Rajor in, in the 1970s, 94% were killed or damaged by, by baobabs within a period of two years once they started. And baobabs, can, can re, some of them can reach a, an age of about 5,000 years. That means that they were 1,700 years old when took on the of Egypt. Now, what's more valuable, an old elephant or an old... It's, it's a problem that, we, that, that, that is bedeviling everybody. Not a, it's not a problem, Ron. It's, it's, it's actually a catastrophe that's unfolding. It is. it is. Well, what we have done now is we have filmed the evidence. We, we don't, haven't gone to do a Walt Disney film on elephants. We've gone there to, to film the damage that we can see with the idea that once we've got it on film, we can show other people. They can also see what we are seeing. That is not just mm -hmm. a destruction of the of the indigenous woodland, total destruction of the indigenous woodland, mm -hmm. but but the change over from a different kind of vegetation that has already happened in, in the Toby area of Botswana, that is the total disappearance of a riverine forest. And the, it changed from one thing to another between 1965 and 1964. And we are picking up in, in Kruger the intermediate habitat change that happened has already happened in Botswana where that change of habitat has happened and it's a change for the worst and it's all the big the big the big acacia trees have, have been these are the main targets but a lot of other very big trees too there are a number that haven't been so badly affected because they're unpalatable to the elephant so the elephant doesn't 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 destroy it but if you can imagine Kruger National Park what it was like in 1960 and what it's like today with 95% less trees, big trees in the habitat. It is tragic, but tourists go in there. South African visitors go in this, in every year they go and see this. And because they go every year, they, they, they don't see the difference because the difference is, is constant but gradual. Yes. And I just hope that we will be able to say, try and see this habitat with my eyes. I see what you're because, trying to do. Because it is only 
It is only when the public can say to the to government in South Africa, to hell with what these animal rightists are saying. Let's have a tourist boycott if we have to, but we've got to save our habitat because habitat is more important than the animal species that, that occupy those habitats. And we are losing all our biological diversity because these animal rightists are terrorizing mm -hmm. African governments. It is terror. It is. Terror, terror, terrorizing means that you, you use... Force. Bad, no. bad means. For, forceful means to make another person or another country abide by what you demand of them. Yeah. It is These animal rights are terrorists. They are doing this and then it's all over the country. And now mm. we have got the British Prime Minister. Mm. The British Prime Minister now is saying we are not going to allow elephant trophies into, into, into the UK because we want to save the elephant. I mean, well, that, that, now we've got that, to, that, that the problem there starts with his wife. Who's That's now right. on this on this bandwagon, this um, anti elephant oh. uh, shooting bandwagon, yeah. and she's getting huge applause from the idiots um, listening in. So you know, Ron, I take my head off to you. What you're trying to do, which is reach the, reach the public, uh, and the hope that they'll put pressure on the politicians to wake up to the reality. But my God, that is a that is a long shot. The, the problem is so many, so few people oh, yeah. understand the enormity of this problem and they just think emotionally. It's, it's, it's money. Your, your animal rights NGOs in the first world are mm. making a fortune mm. out of creating, creating issues in mm. Africa that mm. they can fly sure. in Europe. Yeah. The, the Humane Society of the United States, for example, makes 150 to 200 million US dollars a year on pleading to the public for money for problems that do not exist. Now, the American RICO Act puts it very nicely, and I'm going to say this now, I'll probably be had up in court for, for having said, but I'm gonna say it. If somebody tells a lie and then goes, well, let's say, let's say he goes to the public and says, the elephant is endangered and it's facing extinction. The elephant is not endangered, it's not facing extinction. I've just explained that to you now. Yeah. They say that. They say that to their publics in the Western world. Now, they then go, go to their publics and say, please donate money to us and we will make sure the elephant does not become extinct. If you make money like that out of a lie, that is technically common fraud anywhere yeah. in the world. Yeah. It's common fraud. Mm. According to the, Amer the American RICO Act, which is it's, it's the Racketeering Influenced Criminal Activities Organization Act, they say that if, if someone tells a lie and makes money out of it, that is fraud. Mm. If they practice that same fraud twice inside a period of 10 years, then that steps up a, a case and that, that then becomes a racket. And racketeering in American law is organized crime. Mm. So that makes your animal rightists organized crime criminals. And they are destroying Africa's wildlife because of the gullibility of the wild of the of the European and, and, and American publics who are listening to these bloody idiots. Ron, uh, you, well, in my case, you're preaching to the converted. I don't know if you've ever read uh, James Dellingpole's book, Watermelons, um, yeah. which is about global warming and the environmentalists and stuff. And he's got, uh, there was a, a figure that I picked up there in reading the book about what the annual budget is for the World Wildlife Fund. And it, it, was, it staggered me when I saw how much money that they have at their disposal. And I just, I just thought back and I wrote an article about it because look, I don't have the field experience or the exposure that you've had. But I just, I thought to myself, jeepers, in all the years I've been in Africa and involved in wildlife, I, I mean, I've seen the World Wildlife Fund um, vehicles and stuff in Dar es Salaam and, and Lusaka and stuff, but I, I've, I've never seen anybody from the WWF doing anything useful in the field. And yet they have hundreds of millions of dollars at their disposal and the money keeps coming, coming in. But heaven knows what actually happens to it. Well, let me tell you something about the World Wildlife Fund. The World Wildlife Fund was, in, was started in, 19, I think, 1960. What happened originally was that the, the, the IUCN, was 
was created by the United Nations after the Second World War in 1948. By 1956, it was called the International Union um, for the Protection of, 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 of Animals, um, IUCN. And it didn't take. So they changed the protection to conservation. When it became the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, people started contributing towards it. But they were trying to get things um, sorted out all over the world. They need money and they needed some organ to collect money for the IUCN projects. And that was when the World Wildlife Fund was formed. It was formed to generate funds to to put into practice what the IUCN were, were, were genuinely projecting. But now the World Wildlife Fund has become animal rightists. It has changed mm. totally over. Mm. It is no longer the, 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 the wonderful body that it used to be. And I used to lord it. I don't lord it anymore. I condemn it. I condemn the World Wildlife Fund totally and utterly because they are animal rightists, because I have got no time at all for the animal rights philosophy which is to abolish all animal uses by man. That includes dogs and cats and chickens and horses, riding horses and, and, and hunting and everything. So they want to destroy everything. We must, all, we must all not eat meat. We must all, and farmers must not produce meat for man to eat. He must eat cabbages. Well, I'm not of that ilk and I don't, I don't go along with it. And I'm trying to get the whole public throughout the world to understand how stupid it is for us to listen to these people. Now mm. they are destroying Africa because the people in the rest of the world are listening to what they say yeah. and believe them. And that Ron, is what we have to fight. It's, it's uh, as I say, you preach into the converted, you know, uh, just we're straying a little bit, but I, uh, where I run into trouble with the environmentalists and the, the global warming uh, protagonists is just when you look at Africa, it's not only elephants and wildlife that's doing environmental damage, but it's also human overpopulation. And the, the, the environmental degradation in Africa is probably the worst of any continent in, in the world right now through population densities increasing and more and more pressure on the habitat. And yet you never hear these environmentalists or these global warmists saying anything about curbing population growth, because that, that would be politically incorrect, I suppose. So no, nobody says a word about it. But the fact is, you and I both live in Africa, and we see it almost on a daily basis, how much damage has been done to the environment by overpopulation and slash and burn agriculture, which is also exacerbating the, the wildlife problem because you've just got too many people putting too much pressure on the wildlife habitat. But there's no, there's no attempt being made to get people to breed more responsibly either. Well, let me be totally politically incorrect. I love being politically incorrect when I know I'm, when I believe I'm right. At the moment there are approximately a million people living in Africa south of the Sahara Desert. By the end of this century there are going to be four billion people. Four billion people. Where are we going to put them all? Yeah, no, it's right now it's about a billion, is it? You said a million. It's about a billion now, yes. Yeah, a billion, yeah. Yeah, and it's going to be four billion by when? by the end of the century, by 2100. Now, the, the big thing here is what, what we, the, the rest of the world think that they are saving Africa by not allowing us to, to utilize the wildlife. Uh, we have just started a, a new group in South Africa, incidentally, which we call SUCCO, the Sustainable Use Coalition, where, where all the people who, like the, like the True Green Alliance, that is my, my organization, I'm one of the founding um, members of this, all the hunting organizations, all the other big environmental organizations are clubbing together in order to, to generate a, a power base where we can start fighting these animal rightists. We end up, however, with having, having to fight our own minister who is listening to them rather than to us. Mm. And, you know, I'm saying that this is being totally politically incorrect. I don't mind. I'm saying, I'm saying I have got the right to say what I have to say. And mm. that is our biggest problem is our own minister. Mm. So, but they, as you say, as you say, they are being terrorized by the by yes. the bigger powers. Britain and America put enormous pressure on these African politicians to conform to their way of thinking, um, and unfortunately, they don't have the political will to to disagree. They don't have the guts to do it. That's quite right, mm. and therefore we must expose them as much as we must expose the animal rightists. Mm. They are just as much to blame because they are the implementers of the animal rights policy. So we are doing great things in this country at the moment. The sucker um, um, 
establishment that we've got is going from strength to strength. Um, and they have just had themselves accepted in, in, as, 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 as candidates for, for the CITES meetings officially, which is great because CITES now, CITES is also an animal rights instrument. Two thirds of the NGOs that, that go as accredited um, people to the CITES meetings, two thirds of them are animal rights in orientation and they, they, they want to stop all animal uses. We've got right. situations in this country where we've got white rhinos are being, the horns are being trimmed and we've got a, a massive market for rhino horn. And that's the only thing that is going to save the rhino is, 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 is to, to make it valuable unless wildlife becomes valuable to people, unless elephants become valuable to people. Mm -hmm. Like in, 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 in Botswana, they, the, 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 the president there now has this year allowed 400 elephant bulls to be shot in, in Botswana for the, for the benefit of the local people. It shouldn't be 400 elephants. The animal rights are saying, you, you are cruel, you must save every elephant, which we can't do, of course. But we, we should have 4,000 a year on, on, the, on those hunting lists for the benefit of the people. The people must benefit from this. If they don't, they will be the ones who will, they will be poaching their own, their own animals because their own government doesn't, doesn't, doesn't support them. But the government, Botswana is on the right track. Mm. Our country is not on the right track. South Africa is not on the right track. We've got to tell everybody this. And we mustn't, we mustn't be afraid to stand up and say it. You know, what also catches my attention about these animal rightists, they all claim to be so concerned about animals and people. But if they actually spent a, a bit more time amongst the local people who are exposed to wildlife uh, and understood how hard their lives are being made in many cases by a marauding elephant and crop killing and lions and stuff. You know, these people need to be brought into the equation, into consideration. And so, you know, using these elephant generates revenue for them. And then they're more tolerant of what is actually happening and put more likely to put up with the damage. But, but nobody seems to be paying much attention to what the common, you know, just the, the rural African tribesmen living out you know, in remote areas has to deal with. Unfortunately, Hannes, fortunately you're wrong. The animal rights couldn't care a damn what is happening in Africa. They don't want to know what is happening in Africa. They just want to get um, emotional, mm -hmm. heart tugging issues to ply the gullible members of the society there mm -hmm. and they're not interested in what's happening. All they're interested in is how much money can they make out of the gullible publics in their own country. Yeah. They're interested in money. They're not interested in anything else. They, mm -hmm. These are the people that, if, if we could only get that message over to the gullible publics of the world, we might get somewhere. Because the people who are orchestrating all this, who are, who are causing all this problem in Africa, which is your animal rights NGOs, those people are not telling their own their own uh, publics exactly why they're doing this and they're doing it solely for money there is no other reason 